28, what um, chapter 2 is, is meant to do is now introduce in a little bit more detail um, the players, the different cells of the immune system, um, how they're formed, where they're formed, um, what, how they, where do they mature. So we're going to be talking about, so I mean, I, I always like to put things in a logical categories. So really, if you want to be prepared for exams or, or just have a, a, you know, a strong background in immunology, um, if you could take you know, any of these immune cells, you know, understand from start to, to, to finish, to, from the beginning of their life to the end of their life, what are they doing? How are they formed? Where are they formed? Where are they going? And, and who are they interacting with? And so it's kind of, you can take and decide, okay, B cells. How are B cells formed? Where are they formed? So we're going to talk about um, starting from the hematopoietic stem cell. And this is a stem cell that is, you know, a cell that it, 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 so it, it basically replenishes itself. We don't have a whole lot of them, but they can basically, they provide all of our blood cells white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, everything. Without those hematopoietic stem cells, then obviously wouldn't live because our blood cells are constantly being made new, recycled, um, and we go through them quite a bit. So um, they're a little different than like embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells, you can take an embryonic stem, stem cell and make any cell of the body. These are what we would call kind of adult stem cells where the stem cell has, it's very, um, what we call pluripotent, it can make a lot of different cells, but it's, it can only make blood cells, not um, muscle or, or maybe some other epithelial tissue, you know, so it, it has potential, but not as much as like your embryonic stem cell. Um, and it's actually, you know, if you read the chapter, you know, it's probably not going to be on the exam, but um, it's really interesting how um, that those stem cells were found and discovered and, and then were able to purify those stem cells. Um, a lot of people are working with these somatopoietic stem cells and they're really important in the field as well. Anybody who's going through um, any type of cancer treatment for like leukemia, blood-borne, um, blood-based um, cancers, who gets chemotherapy and is going to basically have their whole immune system wiped out, um, they're going to get these hematopoietic stem cells back. And the way we used to get hematopoietic stem cells was to take bone marrow, which is a very painful procedure. It's hard to get people to donate blood, um, bone marrow. Um, but, you know, through identifying what these hematopoietic stem cells were, we were able to see that oh, they're actually sometimes circulated through the blood. So instead of taking bone marrow, we can collect blood from patients and we can actually use um, drugs to actually um, cause our body to start actually pumping out these hematopoietic stem cells into the blood. And then you can take what's called an apheresis product, product and uh, you can basically hook somebody up with two tubes and run those tubes through uh, a machine that's going to purify out the white blood cells, and then you have like this concentrated um, hematopoietic stem cells that you can give to patients instead of bone marrow. So it's, it's, it's really interesting, and it, it's a little more applicable to a field that you're going to go into. A lot of you who are going to go into clinical areas, one of the first areas I ever worked in was, um, was a lab where we were collecting um, blood um, and, and for giving back to cancer patients. And so if you work in a blood bank, you may work with this, you may work with cord blood. Cord blood is another huge source for hematopoietic stem cells. Um, I've done research with cord blood, so um, you're gonna come across this. So it's always good to kind of know, you know, how did we get to where, where we're at? And so you can understand um, pretty much uh, what you're working with. So, so I want you to be able to take from that first hematopoietic stem cell and say, okay, this hematopoietic stem cell is going to go and it's going to differentiate. It's, become, it's either going to be myeloid in origin or lymphoid in origin, and it's going to go and then make other cells from this subset of cells you're going to make from this subset. We're going to make granulocytes, 
uh, neutral fills, eosinophils. We're going to make macrophages. Um, so dendritic cells. So all these cells are going to be made from this myeloid. And then from the lymphoid origin, we're going to make our lymphocytes, our B cells, our T cells. Our, um, we're going to be making our NK cells, which are part of the innate immunity. So we're going to be making, so be able to follow this. So if I say B cell, tell me, you know, describe the, uh, the development of a B cell. You can say, well, we saw the hematopoietic stem cell, go to a myeloid cell, uh, or sorry, went the wrong way, go to the lymphoid cell, this progenitor then becomes a B cell, and this is an immature B cell. And then we're going to talk about now, this is all happening in the bone marrow. Now, when that cell becomes a B cell, it's going to go out into the periphery, and it's this immature cell. It hasn't come in contact with any antigen, any signal. So it's, it's naive, what we call naive. It's this naive cell going off to Hollywood to become famous or whatever it is. And it's going off into the world. And so it goes out into the blood and it's going to circulate and it's going to go somewhere to, to get experience. And so it's going to go to one of these secondary lymphoid organs. So the primary lymphoid organ here was the bone marrow. Secondary lymphoid organ is going to be um, the lymph node for a B cell. So the B cell is going to traffic to this lymph node where it's going to become experienced. It's going to, so it's, it gets to Hollywood and now it's all of a sudden just hit with life, with experience. It's going to encounter everything that's out there to encounter. And we'll talk about how that happens. And then it, it comes in contact with an antigen that it recognizes because it has a specific receptor that gets tickled and then it becomes mature. <coughs> and where does it go and what does it do from there? It, it's going to go become maybe a plasma cell and start kicking out antibodies to warn everybody don't come to Hollywood. Um, I, I don't know. What, whatever it's going to do, it's going to start kicking out antibodies. Those antibodies are going to go into the circulation to try and fight um, that infection or that antigen that it came across. So that's kind of this progression, but along the way, not only did he encounter antigen, but he um, got a little help from T cells. So that we're going to talk about that interaction too. Because if he didn't have help from T cells, he would say, "Well, you know, I know I recognize this antigen, but you know, it's, it's maybe it's not dangerous, so that it's not going to go on to become an active cell. It's, it's going to kind of get depressed because he, he says, I have no purpose in life because I, I really don't want to be kicking out." Uh, antibodies because maybe there's just not enough danger. So this is kind of what I want you to be able to do with B cells, with T cells, to understand kind of their progression, who they interact with, how they become mature. If they don't get the right signals, they're going to not, they're not going to mature. In fact, a lot of times they're going to just die off. And so we're continue, continually making new cells. If they contact antigen, they become mature. And then they'll go and they'll maybe go into tertiary location, which is going to be maybe site of an infection. So, so that's what we kind of want to cover today really, uh, as quickly as possible. If I can get through this whole lecture before, you know, with a little time left, um, I have an activity that maybe we'll just, we have some <laughs> cells and we'll, we'll get into groups and, and try and actually take those cells through this progress. <coughs> Um, so, um, immune cells, a response, uh, immune responses result from basically this coordinated activity that we talked a little bit about with uh, many cells. We'll talk about those lymphoid organs and uh, the microenvironment. We're just covering microenvironment really briefly, like what happens to what cell, where do, where do they mature, and what part of the, like, for example, the thymus uh, T cells are going to become. Um, T cells in the thymus, what part of the thymus does that happen in? We're not going to go into great detail. Um, I think chapter 14 will go into more detail of microenvironments um, in time and, and um, in, in the immune response because those are really um, actually very important is timing of the immune responses and location of the immune responses because depending on where these responses are happening and the timing of it 
you can either mount a response or actually mount a suppressive response. And um, I, I'll, I'll relate an experience um, that I had actually in research where um, that actually played a huge role um, in whether a therapy was going to be actually helpful or actually um, hinder um, potential treatments based on timing. So um, well, I'll talk, hopefully I'll have time to talk about that more in chapter 14. Okay, so um, we start with our hematopoietic stem cells. They have this ability to differentiate. Again, all our red blood cells and white blood cells um, originate from these, uh, and that process is called hematopoiesis, and this is a highly regulated process. Um, what we mean by highly regulated is we have this homeostasis, and you guys have probably talked about homeostasis before, but within the body, you can look at the blood at any given time of a patient, and you're going to say, well, in this blood, I have 40% of his cells are neutrophils, and 20% of his cells are T cells. And of those T cells, um, you know, about 60% are CD8s, and you know, 30%, you know, 30% are CD4s, and some other percentage. So basically, we it's highly controlled how many cells of what type we're making. So it's a pretty incredible system that you can, at any given time, have, you're constantly making cells, and if you lose blood, for example, or, or have an illness that wipes out some of your white blood cells, your body knows it. Somehow it knows how many cells you have at any given time all throughout your body, and it will start producing more of those cells. Um, you have an infection, it's going to produce more of a certain type of cell, and then after your infection, you're going to go back to that, that baseline. So it's really a, a, a highly regulated process. Okay, right, so here's kind of the overview. This is a good diagram to kind of go through and memorize. I don't necessarily need you to tell me that we start with the eight hematopoietic stem cell. I need a laser pointer. So we start with this hematopoietic stem cell, we go to, so I would memorize that. You go to either myeloid or lymphoid progenitor, I'd memorize that. And then you go to something that's, that's um, kind of uh, somewhere working towards, it's this progenitor cell, and it's working towards becoming a neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, um, whatever cell. And a lot of times, that, and, and this is all happening within the bone marrow, except for here we have the lymphoid progenitor cell that's actually going to go out, and it's either going to become this B cell, or it's going to go out into the periphery and traffic to the thymus where it's going to become a, a T cell. So here we have our, our primary lymphoid organ of bone marrow, and our other primary lymphoid organ of the thymus, and so these are where these cells are developing, becoming the, the end product. Not necessarily a mature cell, but a cell that you would s describe as being a T cell because of what it's expressing, what T cell receptor it has. It's going to have a unique T cell receptor for that cell. The B cell is going to have a unique B cell receptor or antibody that's on the surface <laughs> that's, that is unique to that cell. Um, B cells are going to, um, they're going to look like neutrophils, eosinophils. So then they're going to go out and into the periphery. Um, and they're going to go to secondary sites, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So um, it's good to kind of get a feel for this and what are all the players. Um, we have all these granular sites. We have um, also our red blood cells are derived from this, and so we're constantly renewing our red blood cells. We, you know, our red blood cells have a finite lifespan, and we're constantly making new ones. Um, platelets, important for clotting, um, are going to also be originate from these myeloid progenitor cells. Um, and some cells are going to actually become, um, they're going to um, mature and become like macrophages out in the periphery. Um, so some of the cells that actually mature and become what they are um, out in the periphery are the macrophage and the mast cells will become 
um, will mature into their cell type outside of the bone marrow. But in the most part, cells are differentiating in the bone marrow or in the fungus. Um, and the, so, one of the, the things you're going to come across in the field, and we'll talk about it more in depth <laughs> later, but I just wanted to point out that a lot of these cells were originally discovered because of how they look. They look very different and unique. And so when <laughs> people would look at blood under the microscope, they started to identify these different populations. Um, but then you had these cells, and, and, and it's funny because um, in immunology, we focused on, on, on these cells and we focus on things we can see like antibodies. Um, but we kind of, for a long time, ignored these really plain looking, simple, tiny little cells. I mean, if you look at, if you look at a blood smear, um, you'll, you'll be able to easily find these guys, even though they aren't very common <coughs> in the blood, uh, you'll find lots of red blood cells. Uh, but these guys are a little harder, harder to see because they're Roughly the similar size to red blood cells, but they differ in that they have a nucleus, red blood cells don't. And, and so it was really hard to differentiate a T cell from a B cell, from an NK cell, um, just because they, they all looked alike. But it wasn't, so the advent of uh, monoclonal, an, monoclonal antibodies that were specific for receptors that were starting, to, we were starting to tease out what cells had, what receptor cells had, and we had advances and um, linking to these monoclonal antibodies, um, fluorescent tags, and then we started being able to visualize these. And, and we made huge, huge advances when we, um, with the invention or the discovery of flow cytometry. So a lot of times, if you go into the clinic, um, you're going to see flow cytometry data, or you're going to send blood out to be analyzed via flow cytometry. Um, and and basically, when somebody says flow cytometry, what that is is basically it's an instrument that has a fluidic system that will kind of tease out the cells and, and pass them single file down in front of this laser. And this laser is going to shine a certain wavelength of light through the cell. And depending, and, and you can get some information. If you've tagged that cell with an antibody that fluoresces, at a certain wavelength, you're going to find out what is being expressed on the cell. You're also going to get some scatter. So actually, based on how the light scatters, how long it takes to pass through the cell, how, how much it's dispersed, how much it scatters when it hits that cell, um, it's going to actually give you a lot of information. And so um, you get kind of these plots that show you the the light scatter tells you how granular a cell is, how much light was absorbed, and just by teasing out every single dot represents a cell, and it represents how much light scattered and how much light was absorbed, and, and they plot that, and so you can see, for example, just by looking at light scatter with flow cytometry, I can take somebody's blood sample, and I can say, well, what percentage are lymphocytes? What percentage are monocytes? What percentage are neutrophils, eosinophils? Just based on light scatter, so you, you, we actually can, just by running um, a really quick analysis on somebody's blood, you can um, get some really uh, important numbers. Uh, you can tell if somebody has an infection, maybe they have um, a higher percentage of lymphocytes. That's telling us something's going on. Maybe they're mounting an immune response against some infection, um, or maybe they have um, fewer lymphocytes. Maybe they don't have any CD4, so if we tag the different lymphocytes and find out who are the CD4s and CD8s, um, that's helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. Maybe we'll find out that maybe they have HIV because they don't have any helper T cells anymore. So it's, um, it's a good tool. And so when you send out a CBC or, or send out analysis of blood, a lot of times you'll get a lot of information back. Um, on Canvas, I put uh, a link to this in resources. I think I made like a, a resources module. So if you were to, to go to this, um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but this is a cool resource where you can go through and kind of um, learn about the different cells. Um, goes through and talks about you know what is what are the different cells in the immune system, innate versus adaptive. Um, 
go through. I, I recommend going through, watching the videos, and and kind of learning about what you know. What is a B cell? What is a helper T cell? Cytotoxic T cell antigen presenting cell. And so we'll kind of, I'll try and cover those real quick. But I definitely recommend. Um, Um, so, cells of the immune system, let's, let's now kind of go through. Um, so, like I had talked about, hematopoiesis occurs in the bone marrow. This is where your uh, hematopoietic stem cells are constantly renewed, and they become either this common myeloid progenitor or lymphoid progenitor. And here's um, a concentration and frequency of the cells in the, in the blood, and they got this, this data through uh, Low cytometry. Um, and so um, you can see uh, if we're looking at the leukocytes in the blood, um, we've got neutrophils. So this is just white blood cells. So what percentage of white blood cells? And then of those white blood cells, 50 to 70 percent are neutrophils. So those are the majority of our, our white blood cells are going to be these neutrophils. And neutrophils, um, we'll, we'll talk about those in a sec, but those are the our first responders, those are part of this innate immune response. If you have, um, if I get punctured by a rusty nail, it has bacteria all over it, the first people on the scene are going to be these neutrophils. That's probably why we have so many of them um, circulating at, at any given time. So these neutrophils come in, they degranulate, so the, the granules are full of things that are going to create basically this environment that is not very appealing to bacteria, it's going to start killing things like bacteria. It's also damaging to our own tissue. Um, so um, you get inflammation, you get soreness, um, you get pus. So the main component of pus are the uh, basically the product of the granules of these neutrophils are producing pus, and that pus is an environment that is very uh, um, damaging to cells, and so in, in a way that it's, it's helpful. Um, then we have our lymphocytes, and these are going to include our B cells and T cells. Um, the monocytes, these are our, our cells that will go on. They can become dendritic cells, macrophages. I, they, they're going to be the cells that will engulf things, phagocytose, foreign antigens, and then become pre antigen presenting cells eosinophils, basophils, these are both found in many much smaller numbers, um, but we'll deal with um, uh, either uh, removal of large things, worms, um, basophils are going to be more involved in, in allergic responses. They histamine, so um, it's kind of a, an overview of those. So we're also going to have um, the cells that, and we're not going to talk about these a whole lot because they're really not part of the immune response itself. They're part of more um, what you might have covered in AMP2, talking about blood components and the importance of platelets and, and um, red blood cells. So we move on. Four main types of cells developed from the myeloid. So now we're focusing on this myeloid arm. Um, you get your red blood cells, erythrocytes, your monocytes. Um, granulocytes, so monocytes, are going to go on to become uh, macrophages, dendritic cells. Um, your granulocytes are your neutrophils. Again, like I said, they deal with direct harm. Uh, they directly harm pathogens. Basophils, mast cells, um, inflammation and, al and allergies, and eosinophils, um, antiparasite activity. So their granules will release things like um, proteases that start to break down proteins. So, and then you have your megakaryocytes that go on to, to make platelets. So, here's our neutrophils, multi-lobe nucleus. So, again, some of these are really easier to find and, and, and differentiate and start to study because they look different. They're very large. Um, when we stand, do H and E staining, um, they're colored differently. So, we're able to, to look at these and tell by, by the color that their nucleus stains. Um, who, you know, who's who. Um, you've got your basal cells here, your mast cells. So again, these are all these granular cells that have lots of granules, and they're going to respond to, um, to um, not 
very nonspecifically to danger signals, inflammation that's going on, and they're going to degranulate. Um, if you take, a lot of times you can degranulate, if you take these cells and grow them in culture, you can take that plate and slam it on the, on the, the bench and they'll degranulate. So they, they'll, they'll even respond to more physical um, signals as well. So, um, so eosinophils, oh here, did that thing get on the other page. Um, again, granular, I'm going to respond. So neutrophils, so here's a good table to kind of go through and just um, kind of memorize. I don't expect you to know everything. It, it just, it's just too much information to, for me to expect you to hold in your head. But know that neutrophils, basically, they have these granules that have proteases. That's easy enough to remember. Um, antimicrobial proteins. Uh, they're involved in tissue remodeling because if there's tissue damage, they actually are the first people to come in and kind of clear things out so that new cells can come in and replace. So they're really part of, they are part of tissue remodeling. Um, direct harm to pathogens because they're gonna, they're gonna basically degranulate and create pus in this, this environment that's, that's um, gonna start killing um, things directly. Um, then you've got the eosinophils, what are, you know, just in general, what are they doing? Um, they are going to be antiviral, or um, they're also going to attract leukocytes, so more cells, they're going to bring more cells in, they're going to, they're going to send out the signal, they're going to create a gradient of chemokines that are going to, cut. basically this gradient is a pathway that other cells can now walk down toward the concentrate, you know, toward the more concentrated area where they're starting sending out that signal. Um, and these cells kind of act like, um, we'll see, we'll watch the movies, but they basically will walk just like, um, uh, what are those? Um, amoebas. So they kind of amoeba kind of walk <coughs> um, and follow pathways. Um, basophils um, modulate the adaptive immune response, regulation of inflammation, so um, again, um, just kind of have a rough idea of what these different players are. And these are all part of your innate immune response. So um, not necessarily direct players in adaptive immunity, but they are the first players that respond very quickly. And then they mount cytokines and bring in the adaptive players like T cells and B cells that will then um, mount an adaptive response and hopefully more of a long-term response and be prepared for a secondary infection or, or a later infection. So, um, I'm going backwards. Okay. Um, macrophages and okay, so here we go. Macrophages and neutrophils are specialized for phagocytosis again. Um, so, um, that's another thing that they do. Um, other than degranulate, they also will phagocytose um, bacteria, um, large, large um, antigens, and they will then present them. So we're going to talk later on about um, MHC molecules, major histocompatibility complex molecules, which basically are the molecules. These are molecules that are going to alert the immune system. So these are like receptors that pick up little pieces of peptide. And so the, the link I gave you guys has a little video showing um, protein being made. So let's say a virus gets into a cell and it starts making viral proteins. Those viral proteins get ubiquinated. They get targeted to a proteasome. They get chewed up. Those chewed up pieces get further chewed up into little peptides. Those peptides go into the end of plasmic reticulum through a uh, special, um, through a molecule called TAP. They come in and then in there, these MHC molecules are being, newly made molecules are being made and they have this groove and that groove fits a wide array of peptides. These peptides will fit in the groove so they, they're like two little hands holding a peptide, trap it to the cell surface and just hold that peptide. And that's, that's what they do. So these, um, these, what are called professional antigen presenting cells. These are, are macrophages. These are uh, phagocytic cells. Any cell that's going to phagocytose things, and like dendritic cells are one of the most important 
um, antigen presenting cells. Um, so these dendritic cells are going to capture antigens, viral antigens from the environment, maybe they're infected with virus themselves, are going to present that antigen to T cells. So they're going to just be holding this antigen. T cells are going to come along. We'll talk about how T cells, their T cell receptor is specifically designed to recognize these MHC molecules. And they kind of slow down, look at the MHC molecule, and if they fit onto that antigen, then they, they basically become active. They start signaling. They become active. So antigen-presenting cells, they have uh, kind of these non-specific MHC molecules that present lots of different, so they aren't specific like an antibody. They, they'll present everything. They're very promiscuous. They present, they just basically coat the surface with hundreds of thousands of different little chunks of, of protein, little chunks of peptide, and then the T cells come in, recognize, if they maybe recognize one of them, and then they have their T cell receptor is specific, and then they'll become activated and they start proliferating. So, yes? Uh, what about ABC? Mm -hmm. What is monodopic how many receptors are there? How many MHC molecules? Yes, there that is holding up. Lots. <laughs> How many? Roughly. Um, average stuff, you know. Um, I I'd have to look it up, but um, I'm sure it's over. It's it's in the the millions probably. I mean, they, they're uh, lots. Yeah, it's yeah. There's lots of MHC molecules. Lots and lots, and they're they're not just evenly spread either. They're also localized, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. They're kind of localized in, in chunks and can be further localized into so target yeah. areas where those T cell receptors will come and kind of makes it so that if you have two cells that come into contact with, and I have a receptor on one side of the cell and this receptor is on the other side of the cell, we actually, they'll, they'll pull their receptors all over to, together so that they're... So that they neighbor. Yeah. 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 Um, when cell and also what um, I will talk about later, but even the even the MHC molecules that are inside the cell will quickly get sh shuttled to the surface if it contacts the T cells, and so you know if even even what's not on the surface they'll even send more molecules to the surface if they're being probed by a T cell. So it's really a uh, it, this is, these processes are ongoing, fast. But they're they're very um, dynamic. So uh, now, so so that's kind of we've got these these cells which are mostly innate, but also um, phagocytic and and going to be our antigen presenting cells. So these are the guys that are are going to be first responders. Also, they're going to be guys who pick up lots of antigens and they're going to take it and they're going to um, activate um, the, the lymphoid some of these lymphoid cells, the lymphocytes. Um, and these are part of the adaptive immune response. So we've got our players, our B cells. These are the ones producing antibodies. Our T cells. These are the cells. These are our cytotoxic T cells, our helper T cells. Um, we also have what are called NK T cells. Um, these also have T cell receptors. They're just not as diverse as the T cell receptors we find on, on our um, cytotoxic and helper T cells. And we have NK cells. Now, all, all, out of all of these B cells, T cells, um, NK T cells are all part of adaptive. NK cells are um, part of more of an innate. They're the link, uh, a link between innate and adaptive because they have receptors that are not diverse. They all have the same receptors, but they, again, are one of these receptors that responds to common, um, common antigens that are associated with pathogens, so the pathogens. Um, so we've got these NK cells that will respond to uh, lipids that are common on, on um, pathogens, and then they'll become activated and bring in uh, lymphocytes. Um, and then, um, they, again, as mentioned, they all look the same under a microscope, but they all have these different these cluster. Of, they call it cluster of differentiation because when we first started discovering these uh, these um, uh, the antibodies that were specific for these, you know, one group would have found an antibody and called it something, 
And another group would have found an antibody and called it something because they were just basically putting antigens into either mice or hamsters or whatever and then looking for antibodies that were specific for those. They all found that they were finding that, oh, our antibody is specific for the same protein that your antibody is. So they kind of clustered them together and called them CDs. And I'm sure when they called them CDs, they thought, oh, we're only going to find a handful of these. But now we have like 300 or maybe even more CD markers. And so they were calling them CDs. So we've got CD. It was easy when you started with CD1 and CD2 and CD4s and CD8s. But then we started worrying when we got to CD80 and CD127. And then, you know, now we're into CD200. So uh, it's a lot of memorization of just CD followed by a number. So some things still go by the name, maybe their original name. But so that does, it actually does get a little difficult when you're in the field because depending on if you're talking to a researcher or you're talking to a clini clinician, somebody might say, well, uh, this antigen presenting cell um, has lots of um, co stimulatory molecule B7 on it, B7.1. And you're like, what, what's B7.1? And then they say, oh, it's CD80. And so they'll go by. <laughs> different nomenclature depending on who you're talking to, so it does become a little bit of a hassle. But um, so, but for the most part, those CDs are going to basically be um, things like, for example, helper T cells. What makes that a helper T cell is it has CD4. So uh, this guy, CD4 molecule. So that's what makes it. Uh, that's how we know that he's a helper T cell. And this guy has CD8, and that's how we know he's a cytotoxic T cell. And B cells have a different CD marker. A CD, if you have CD19, I know it's probably a B cell. Uh, natural killer cells have a different CD. I can't remember off the top of my head what that number is. Um, so um, our CD markers are going to. Um, so if we stain blood lymphocytes, I can count how many T cells, helper T cells I have versus cytotoxic T cells thanks to our CD um, markers. I would assume, since there's so many, if you're working in the field, you have to reference what these are a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you'll, you'll memorize them you'll very quickly. Oh, okay. You will, and, and it, won't, you, it won't take a lot of effort. You're just going to hear them over and over, uh, especially if you're working with blood. Um, you, you'll know. Um, so here's kind of a very short list of CDs. Important ones. CD3, all T cells express CD3. Um, and so this is kind of, so if it's CD3, I know it's a T cell, um, it's not a B cell. If it's CD4, I know it's a helper T cell. If it's uh, CD8, I know it's a cytotoxic T cell. If uh, CD16, um, we're going to be an NK cell. CD19, I've got it right, so CD19 was a B cell. So uh, again, and this is just, you know, you again, I don't I try to memorize these, you just talk about them all the time, and you know, CD28. Um, it is a receptor for B7, like I was talking about earlier, B7 is a co-stimulatory molecule that is on our antigen presenting cells, and then CD28 would be the receptor on, on our T cells. So T cells have this receptor that if they, so that tells a T cell, when I see antigen, am I seeing it on an epithelial cell? Or am I seeing it on an antigen presenting cell? So that's the other thing that makes antigen presenting cells special, is that they express co-stimulatory molecules. And, and they do what they say. They co-stimulate. They, if, if I have an IE T cell and it has a certain, it has a T cell receptor that, see, that can see antigen A. And it goes into the periphery and it sees an epithelial cell with antigen A. It might, be, it binds to that, sticks around a little while. But it, because it didn't get a co it didn't get co stimulation, it might go off and die. And the reason is because um, maybe he escaped becoming a T cell, and maybe he recognized self. So he got out into the periphery and saw self. So I don't want him to proliferate. But if he sees it in context of an APC, well, APCs are synonymous with going to areas of inflammation, picking up lots of, of debris and presenting it. So if it sees it in context of the APC. Um, it'll become an active proliferating T cell, maybe a memory T cell. So um, the context with which T cells see things is really important. Um, Can I ask you something? When you say they migrate to a periphery, 
What do you mean by that? Uh, outside of the bone marrow, and when I say periphery, I mean Anyways. anything that's not uh, a specific um, primary or secondary uh, lymphoid organ. So it's not the not. Yeah. So it goes into body. the blood. It goes into the periphery. It goes into tissue. It's periphery. You know, arm, everything mm -hmm. is covered. Yeah. So anything that's not where it's developing into a specific cell, if it goes out into the field, yes. periphery field, um, going out into the real world. You would form it like a, you know, like a liver, you know, lung. Well, you could, I, you could even count liver or lung as periphery because it's maybe not the cell isn't developing in the liver or lung. It's going there to actually look and 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 look for um, infection. So these cells are circulating throughout the whole body. They're moving around. They are. These cells are totally ADD. They are attention. They they are moving all the time, and they are um, circulating constantly, and they're looking all the time, so to see if they can find their antigens. That's just their only job. Yep. And they're looking for these antigens, they're called naive cells? Well, if they haven't differentiated, if they have never seen the antigen, they're called, they're a naive cell. They have no antigens. Yeah, they haven't differentiated, like for example, a T cell, a naive T cell is just naive T cell. It, it um, help, naive helper cell, it can, once it sees antigen, then it has a further decision to make. Do I want to become um, a type 1 helper T cell, which is going to stimulate um, a cellular response. It's going to help um, cytotoxic T cells. It's going to do a lot. It's still going to start kicking out. Um, it's going to do something. When they're naive, they're not doing a whole lot. They're looking. But then once they see antigen, they're going to start kicking out cytokines. They're going to start... Um, basically signaling certain type of responses. And that can be good, uh, it can be a, a, an attack, it can be helping an attack, which is the case of healthy T cells, or it could be suppressing. So those, that differentiation could be a suppressive cell. It could become a, 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 a what's called, so T cell example, CD4 T cell. It sees antigen. It's got to decide, am I going to be, start, am I going to alert the immune system? Or am I actually going to suppress it? So it can become what's called a regulatory T cell and become a suppressive cell that's shutting down the immune response. And T regs, regulatory T cells, are actually the last line of defense against autoimmunity. Um, people who don't have T regs or regulatory, so if they can't, if their T cells can't differentiate from regulatory T cells, they actually have a lot of autoimmune diseases because um, T cells sometimes will develop and get out into the periphery, outside of the, the outside of the thymus. And once they get outside of the thymus, if they recognize self, they're going to attack self. The regulatory cells are kind of that last line of defense. So if that helper T cell sees the antigen in the right context, it's going to go gangbusters and start attacking or start mounting the response. But if it sees it in the wrong context, if it sees it in the periphery and there's no danger signals, there's no antigen presenting cells presenting it, it's going to become a regulatory cell. Um, and actually, it also, regulatory cells, they can also become regulatory cells after a long um, chronic event. Um, and that's to, to make sure that you don't mount an immune response that it just overwhelms you. And so it's, um, but naive just means these cells haven't decided what they're going to do. They're looking. And they haven't found antigen yet. So, um, they're so is that just, um like, I have a question. So do these T cells, do they have like different um, receptors for different antigens? So every T cell has a specific uh, so T cell receptor for one antigen. Okay. I was gonna and every B cell has a, for one antigen. And that the antigen presenting cells are presenting lots of, lots of different, different um, antigens. Okay. They're presenting the antigen, just all these different little peptides and sugars. They are presenting them just everything. And then the T cells, who were very specific, come. They, it's um, APCs are like Tinder, I guess. Isn't that what, and then T cells are specific people that are scanning Tinder for their match. Right. They find their match. <laughs> then you know, so, I don't know, I'm trying to. <laughs> so yeah, the immune the immune, immune response is very. Um, these are cells, yeah, so it, it can be explained that way. Um, so, uh, B cell, let, so let's talk about, let's switch gears from T cells and talk about B cells. Um, B cells, 
are going to develop in the bone marrow. Um, uh, serendipitously, and luckily, I guess, um, when B cells were discovered, they were discovered in birds in this organ called bursa, which um, started with B. So they call them B cells. Luckily, in humans, they also develop in the bone marrow, so it's easier to remember B cells bone marrow. Um, so B cells will become go from these myeloid, I mean lymphoids, are right, progenitor cells, and they'll start as very naive cells. So within the bone marrow, so within like long bones and in our uh, hip bones, which is where they usually go for um, bone marrow. Um, so these long bones, hip bones, um, and, and you take an AMP and know that, that in the, the bones, these long bones, you have um, the medulla, medullary area, you have um, the bone marrow in there, and you have these osteocytes. Osteocytes are the, the bone producing cells. Um, Surrounded around these osteocytes are going to be these hematopoietic stem cells, which are going to differentiate, and as they become B cells, and, and as they differentiate and become more B cell like, those cells are going to migrate towards this um, out to the inner region where it's more vascular, and they're moving toward the vascular because they're going to go out through that vascular system once they become B cells and go out into the periphery or. The second, actually, they're going to move from there and then move to the secondary um, lymphoid tissue, which is going to be your lymph nodes. So B cells are kind of taking this path from bone marrow. They become naive B cells, and they move to the lymph node. And that lymph node is where they're going to stay and kind of look for, um, and they will be brought um, antigens to those lymph nodes. So. Um, we have the endosteel, which is going to be that ring kind of around where those osteocytes are going to be and the, the immature HSCs are going to be. And then you have this uh, vascular niche where they're going to mature and then move um, along these reticular cells and, and then migrate to these sinuses. Um, so T so B cells. That's where B cells start off life. T cells will be these immature cells. These immature lymphoid cells are going to go out, and they're going to go to um, the thymus. So here's your heart. Thymus sits right on top of it. Um, before they discovered what was happening in the thymus, they thought it was just this vestigial thing that had no importance. Um, but people luckily found out it you remove that thymus, you got very sick, and, um, and so in, and that was because the if you don't have a thymus, you don't have T cells. Um, interestingly enough, um, and this has all happened since I've been in in the field. Um, there's been a second thymus that's actually been found in mice, um, a smaller thymus, which is really interesting because. Um, as you get older, so this thymus starts out really large um, when you're an infant, and once you hit puberty, it starts to atrophy and get smaller. And um, and this is applicable because uh, most of the people you're working with, if you go into camp tumor immunology or, or cancer patients, have very small thymus just because they atrophy over time. And but yet we would see them still able to develop new um, T cells, and so we always thought, well, what? And so actually there was a lot of conjecture out there that T cells could develop outside of the thymus. Um, but now actually they found a second thymus in mice, which actually is populated with a lot more mature um, T cells. There, there's some, uh, that theory that T cells can develop outside the thymus may not be totally correct. So, um, make a long story short. Just, yeah. so where's the second thymus? Is it, you say it's it was um, somewhere along the, ver along the vertebra. And, and um, because it was so small, it was hard to find. Um, also, most lymphoid tissue is very, looks like fat. And so, you know, you look at these anatomy models, and they're clean and perfect, and everything's in the perfect place. But when you open up a, an animal or a human, um, there's fat in different places. You know, it's, it's hard to, it's really hard. Like lymph nodes, they look like little fat nodules. 
Yeah, I saw that in the open lab last year. Yeah, so I mean, lymph nodes are, you know, they look like little fat modules. So if you don't know what you're looking, you don't know where you're looking, and they're really easy to miss. So you know, they found that second thymus in, in, in mice, and probably up until that point, you just been assumed it was this little fat nodule or something. Three to five thymus in I have not read anything about a second thymus in humans yet. That doesn't mean there's not one, but um, we're still finding things. I mean, we've just uh, like last year or a year before they discovered another ligament in the knee you know, that they never know about. So I mean, we're still we're still learning about anatomy. No, no, mice. No mice. Okay, mice. Yeah. No, I no. See, I was pointing to where they are in mice. If I if I were a mouse. Oh um, yeah. So. Um, so you start out, so you start out, you have these immature, um, not even T cells, they're called double negatives. Um, that means they don't have a CD4 receptor, they don't have a CD8 receptor, so they don't have a helper T cell receptor, they don't have a cytotoxic T cell receptor, and they come in um, to your, the thymus, and they come into this, this region, and so we have different regions, we have the, um, some capsular cortex, cortex in the medulla, um, and these are much tighter packed the cells, and you have these double negatives go up to the um, subcapsular cortex, and they'll then become, they will start to mature and become double positive, where they have both a CD4 and a CD8 T cell receptor. And these are specific receptors. These are receptors that um, went through a process where they they made a specific T cell receptor, and every T cell receptor is that receptor. And when they're double positive, they go through a process called negative selection. Negative selection occurs in that cortex, and they basically will go around and they will look at antigen. There are these antigen presenting cells. There's dendritic cells in here, and these dendritic cells are presenting, and they're called dendritic cells because they have dendrites that come out and they increase the surface area, and that increased surface area gives more areas to present antigens. And these, what's unique about the thymus is, um, these cells have um, transcription um, molecules in them that basically turn everything on, transcriptionally speaking. So they're making, these cells represent um, every cell on the body. They are, making pretty much anything that you have, genetically speaking, they're making it, and they're presenting it. They're chewing up, chewing up those proteins in the little peptides, and they're presenting those peptides, be their MHC molecules on their cell surface, and they are being, basically, these T cells are just walking all through here, looking at, you know, perusing, and if they bind to something, if they, if they bind onto something, they die. They, they, they basically signal for apoptosis and will die. So a lot of the cells die during this negative selection. So who bundles things in the dark? The double negatives? So those double negatives, if they come in contact with uh, antigen, mm -hmm. and they bind to that antigen, so there's, there's, it's a good fit. So mm -hmm. basically it's a locking key mechanism to where if they, if they fit onto that antigen, mm -hmm. they will now signal, and that signal at this developmental stage is signals for apoptosis for cell death. They will then become a single positive cell where they'll choose either to be a CD4 or CD8. In general, we have twice as many CD8s as CD4s. Um, tell you the truth, um, I, I don't know if it's 100% understood how they decide, um, but um, we can go into that in more detail when we, we cover that chapter. Um, but they become a single positive. They become a CD4 or a CD8. And they go through a, a second round of selection, which is called positive selection. And now they're looking to say, well, OK, I didn't see anybody that I, I recognize, so I get to live. But now they're looking to see, do I have some specificity? So do I bind weakly? Do I bind a little bit to the MHC molecules? Now, MHC <coughs> molecules are unique. That's, so when you have a, a, a transplant, MHC is the reason you're going to accept or reject that transplant. So we have a lot of alleles, different alleles of MHC markers. And that's because 
those MHCs, even though they present a pretty broad array of different peptides, they're still somewhat specific. Like, I like this MHC is only going to present peptides that have um, a two specific amino acids in certain places or within a certain range. And if it has those two, it'll 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 hold on to that. So another allele, it'll hold on to a different kind of have a different signature that it, it recognizes and holds on to. It's a very non-specific thing because every other amino acid every other amino acid in there could be a different amino acid. And um, and um, so basically that allows for so if we that's why um, that genetic difference that we all have different MHC molecules is advantageous because if uh, a certain virus comes around and we all catch it um, this is it's random by chance whether that virus is going to make a protein that has a certain peptide that's going to be presented to it really well. And so if you, uh, some of you are going to survive and some of you are not because some of you are going to present antigens from that virus and some of you aren't. So it's advantageous that we all have different MHC molecules. That just becomes a hindrance now when you're trying to give somebody an organ. Um, so um, why did I go there? Um, <laughs> because um, these T cell receptors also have to kind of recognize that MHC molecule so that when they're going around scanning things, they're not they're just not like flopping around and, and have no specificity. They have to have a little bit of specificity so that they are looking in the right place. So that they they will actually sit and bind. They won't fit perfectly, but they'll fit onto that MHC molecule that's your MHC molecule. And they'll look. And they didn't bind strongly because they didn't bind strongly before. But they bound a little bit, which means that they're going to be able to look at that MHC molecule. So that positive selection is selecting for T cells that are useful. Um, if, they, if they don't even recognize the MHC molecule, they're not going to recognize something in context of the MHC molecule. So this positive selection now occurs. And if they have a little bit of specificity to the MHC molecules, then they go on and they become your naive CD4 or your naive CD8 T cell. And single positives, they go out now, and then they will traffic into the lymphatic system, into the lymph nodes, and traffic through the lymph nodes, and go through that whole circuit of lymph nodes, go back into the blood, circulate through the blood, back through the capillaries. So you guys have studied this, and if anybody took AMP2, this is a circular circuit of blood, capillaries, out the capillaries, into the lymph nodes, into through the lymph node circuit, back to so basically they're running a circuit. They're looking around, and, and, and now we're going to be looking for energy. I still don't get the, the whatever. Okay, you have double negative, so you so they don't have any no T cell receptors. Yes. So you see something, you catch something. They choose to die or to survive. Well, once they become double positive, so first they become double positives. Okay. So they start as double negatives, but once they get in and they say, okay, now it's time to send you down this water slide or whatever it is, uh -huh. they turn on both receptors. Okay. So both receptors are expressed now. Okay. That's when negative selection begins. So now they're looking for, do I recognize somebody? Who recognize? Double positive or double? The double positive. Double positive. Yeah. Uh, to recognize any... MSC molecule, you know, a little bit of specificity. Oh, uh, a lot. Um, so if they bind to anybody strongly, mm -hmm. they're gonna they're gonna die. So that oh. they're looking for basically they're looking to see do I do I recognize self managing So this is where all our, our and it's not a hundred percent. It, and maybe they'll sneak through and they just didn't come in contact with that one self antigen that maybe is expressed out here. Maybe it's an antigen that's expressed really low levels. Maybe it's um, um, one, one, of the, one of the antigen targets for diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Um, they actually found that the, the protein that is expressed in the thymus is a little bit different than the protein that's expressed in the periphery. And so the 
you get some T cells that come out not having seen a potential self antigen that is expressed in the periphery. So it's not 100%. But for the most part, it does a really good job at getting rid of T cells that are specific for self, self antigens. So, with, with, with T cell come out from cytos? If you said a double so after he's gone through negative selection, so he's he, we know he's not he doesn't recognize self. Then he goes through positive selection. He kind of rec he recognizes MHC molecules a little bit, so he binds to MHC. So MHC molecules. So MHC. Um, so there's these MHC class two molecules, which are a, head, a heterodimer, Let's, and then there's um, so these are MHC. Class two molecules, and there's and these are what CD4 is recognized. So CD4, that CD4 molecule actually recognizes a thing and, and, and will actually strengthen any type of interaction. So we've got our T cells, and here we have our antigen presenting cells, and our antigen presenting cells have MHC, and then they will bind to an antigen. So let's call this an antigen. And so our T cells, so these are CD4 T cells, because have this T cell receptor that will maybe, so maybe this T cell receptor, let's say he has this round groove and he, he sees this round antigen. Um, so that if he sees that antigen, he's going to bind and he's going to bind really strong. He's going to sit there for a while. And um, so CD8, there's M, this thing called MHC class 1, which is actually looks a little bit more kind of like, like this. So usually MHC class 1 is depicted more as kind of a single kind of molecule. And it will hold these little peptides, little chunks of peptides. So we'll talk about the differences between MHC class 2 and 1. Um, Right now, I guess the most important thing to, to know is MHC class 2 is expressed in antigen presenting cells or professional antigen presenting cells. MHC class 1 is expressed on just about everybody. Okay, so, and these are CD8s, so CD8 or cytotoxic T cells. These are helpers. And these have your T cell receptor, and, and maybe they. Recognize this. So um, basically, that first during negative selection, if it recognizes this antigen, it's going to die. During 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 positive selection, it's not going to recognize the antigen because we already went through that process. But if it doesn't recognize, if it doesn't kind of, if it doesn't see this MHC molecule, if it doesn't have any type, if it doesn't even slow down. When it sees this MHC molecule, it, it's it's not going to be productive. So here, during positive selection, you're looking at is does it recognize self MHC? And that's where the trouble comes in with 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 um, transplants. Is if I get a transplant, I have not selected. It's potential that my T cell will recognize that other MHC molecule, that other allele. As it, it's going to bind to it because I haven't selected for or against it. He's never seen that that shape, so it might bind to that shape strongly, or it also might see. You might be making a bunch of different peptides that it just it is never selected against, and that you're going to get a response. Right? Yeah. Um, so if the the single if the double positive cell has no affinity to the MHC two, then it will become a single positive cell mm -hmm. and become a Natural killer, or and then it, it becomes, will not it, become it, a it becomes a CD4 or a CD8 cell, so it becomes either cytotoxic or helper. So even if it doesn't have the affinity, it could still become a T helper cell. It's not an mm -hmm. effective one. Yeah, okay. yeah. And then positive selection is to make sure that it sees MHC, it, it, that it sees the MHC molecule itself. So there's, I guess, two levels of specificity. There's does my T cell receptor recognize MHC? Does it? Recognize self antigens in the context of MHC, which is bad. First is good, second is bad.
Um, okay, so now we'll continue it. Um, so then the T cells go out and um, they go into the um, lymph nodes. So our secondary um, organs are going to be lymph nodes, spleen. Uh, the mucosa associated lymphoid tissue in our mucous membranes um, in the gut, for example, is a really important one. Um, and other diffuse and loosely organized areas. Um, so ba basically, um, the skin is another basically secondary uh, lymphoid organ because it's populated with mature cells that are, are, are going to be kind of sitting there waiting kind of like um, sentinels. Um, so they're connected via blood and lymphatic. So um, again, remember our blood capillaries will meet up with our lymphatic system and the fluid, the interstitial fluid, the fluid, the protein rich fluid that's in our blood is always constantly going to be leaking out of those capillaries, taking with it nutrients, um, sugars, so it's a, the tissues need that. But then you don't want to have pressure building up. So most of that 80% or so of that fluid comes back into the capillaries, circulates back through the, the um, blood. But the rest of that, that, that becomes lymph, um, becomes, goes into the lymph node or into the lymphatics. And so the other 20 some odd percent of that liquid will get soaked up and move through the lymphatics and start to move cells through the lymphatics, yeah. What percentage of the, the cells in our body are due to bone marrow or thymus? And so, what percentage are due to the spleen? Um, so the majority of cells in the lymphatics are going to be lymphocytes, so B cells, T cells. Um, and the majority of them are moving through. Um, they're just different pathways, like the spleen, for example, is directly um, connected to our, our blood vessels. And so you have a lot of, um, and spleens at different times will have different amounts of cells. Um, spleen actually is an interesting thing. They used to think it was just this um, reservoir for, for blood, or red blood cells, platelets, for white blood cells. Um, because, you know, people would get in a car wreck, they'd take the spleen out, and they'd be fine, you know, adults. Um, so the spleen was useless. It was just this reservoir. Uh, we would take apheresis products from people and you'd see the spleen shrink because as we we're taking white blood cells, the spleen would start to provide white blood cells. So you could actually see this if you did a CAT scan, you could see the spleen start and the finish be all shriveled. Um, so up until just recently, the spleen was throwaway organ, but now it's actually the spleen is going to be have, it had like a lymph node, it's going to be set up in a certain... So it varies depending on the infection? Yeah, but very dependent on infection, very good, going to vary dead. But um, percentage-wise, I mean, there is a huge pool of white blood cells, but the spleen is a very large organ, but there's only one of them as opposed to the lymph nodes, which there's lots of lymph nodes. So, I mean, I, I, I couldn't tell you ratios or percentages. Um, there are a lot of cells in the spleen, though, but um, I, yeah, I don't know percentage. But the cells are going to be circulating through the spleen now back into the blood. So I mean, they don't. It, it's not static at all. So it, it, and it is going to vary too, based on you know what what do I have in the blood? Do I have enough cells? First, I'll pull from the spleen. Then I'll and, and while I'm pulling from the spleen, maybe I'll start making new cells of the bone marrow. So these are really dynamic systems, even more so than like the bone, which you know is constantly adding bone. Taking away those. Yeah. This is really, they're really dynamic. But um, yeah. There's hope for the appendix. Hey, yeah, yeah. Well, I, actually, I think the appendix is, is playing more of a role in um, gut microbiota. So um, that might, um, that maybe the appendix actually does have some importance. Um, when you take off the appendix, it doesn't matter. No, this is when the appendix moves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it can affect your your microbiota. That's all. Same. Again, like the spleen, um, adults where you, you, you remove the spleen, um, usually fine. Um, if you remove the spleen at a younger age, um, you have more, more propensity for bloodborne infections. So um, it depends when you have a splenectomy. Um, so timing could be a thing as well for the 
a lot of people, um, when you have your appendix removed, it's usually later in life. So maybe it has more of a, um, a role earlier in life. A lot of our things that have a role are usually earlier in life because their role is just, uh, if you talk about evolution, it's just to get you to the age of mating, and once you're, you've done that, then it really doesn't matter what happens to you after that, right? So, so why appendix removal without being attached? Just where it is in shape. <laughs> and by that time in life, it, it doesn't really genetically matter, but I mean, uh, you know, matter whether you live or die. <laughs> um, so lymphatics, back to lymphatics. Um, again, if you remember back to anatomy, you have um, fluid going out of the capillaries, coming back into the capillaries, that fluid, and so that we don't have an edema or, or build up of fluid, um, is going to come back into the, through the lymphatics, and it's going to traffic through the lymphatics and, and help circulate, so move move um, cells through the lymphatics so that they can then traffic the lymph nodes. Um, lymph nodes and spleen are the most um, highly organized, so if they're organized, they have um, regions that are going to have certain roles. And so they have T-cell rich regions, B-cell rich regions, dendritic cell rich regions, and it looks like we probably need to, I need to finish here. So. We're going to, on Monday, continue on talking about lymph nodes, spleen. We're going to quickly go through them. So read up on lymph nodes and spleen, because I'd, I'd really like to just kind of get in here and have questions and answers. We'll, we'll look at the, the makeup. So when you focus on the lymph node and spleen, um, focus on where are um, antigen-presenting cells, the dendritic cells? Where are they populating? Where are the B cells populating? And then where do the B cells, when they encounter antigen, where do they move to? They create these germinal centers. Where are the T cells? And what are the T cells doing? And how do the T cells, how are the T cells um, seeing what they're seeing? How do they look at, how do they move along the antigen presenting cells? So they follow a certain path. And they just kind of make the circuit. They make the bar circuit. They look for antigens. And then they go back out. And so um, look at that. Same with the spleen. Spleen is very going to be very similar to the lymph node in, in, in its makeup and how it, it, it responds and how it mounts immune responses. So uh, look at those.